You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. As I said, I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy, and um, I'm an allergist here at Children's Mercy Hospital, and I'm going to be talking about allergy shots. Now, this is part of what I call our orientation series. It was supposed to be presented in July. Here it is, September 9th. Things kind of get out of control. Next year, I think our full orientation series will be given in July. The purpose is to provide uh, kind of basic information about how to treat patients using these allergy techniques. So I don't plan to have a lot of, you know, uh, journal articles and graphs and figures and data and meta-analyses and all of that stuff. There's a little bit of that. But what I really hope is to show you, at least from my perspective, how you do it. Just the practical, how do you do allergy shots? Allergy shots is important because it's what allergists do. And it's kind of one of the things that we uniquely do because very few, if any other specialties, do allergy shots. There are a few. I think ENT allergy does it, and there's some primary care doctors who do it. But for the most part, allergy shots are given by allergists. These are my disclosures. These are my learning objectives. This isn't CME, but I feel an obligation to provide these things. Anyway, and I'd like to start out by just asking a question. Um, And Dr. Powershard, I think you were going to be joining me in our discussion. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds good. Are you there? Yeah. So let me just ask you each of these questions and see what you think. Uh, We have a 12-year-old with nasal allergies lasting two weeks during oak pollen season. Does that guy need allergy shots? Probably not. Probably not. Just two weeks, and then the rest of the year he's fine. Why, why bother? Yeah. Four-year-old with nasal symptoms that occur in episodes lasting seven to ten days, more frequent in the fall, and no symptoms between episodes. I, with how episodic it is, I wouldn't think that would also require shots. I would think more maybe like cold, like we're recurrent colds or something like that. So I, I wouldn't recommend shots for that patient either, especially four or two on top of that. Absolutely. Yeah. He's he's getting colds. I, I didn't even tell you what the allergy test showed. Let's say it showed all kinds of allergies. With this history, still wouldn't give him allergy shots. Yeah. He's getting colds. No symptoms between episodes. 14-year-old with chronic urticaria. We see this all the time. Mm-hmm. Dermographia has numerous positive skin tests for aeroallergens, but only minimal nasal symptoms. So um, I would not also recommend shots for this person because the positive tests likely have nothing to do with the urticaria. I know you, there are indications for atopic dermatitis, but not urticaria, exactly. especially no symptoms. He doesn't have nasal symptoms, and he has positive skin tests because he has dermographia. In fact, everything react, probably the saline reacted too. Sadly, I see this. I see patients who have had skin testing done that was basically just dermographia. And when you do a blood test or something, they actually don't have allergies. So be very careful when reading and interpreting test results. Two-year-old with asthma triggered by colds, dust mite, and mold. Okay. You want to give the two-year-old allergy shots? I mean, I would prefer not to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I would just say environmental avoidance measures. And two-year-olds just so young. I know there's no technical lower limit, but I don't think I'd do that either. Yeah, I probably would hold off. There, there are allergists who would do it if they think that the dust mite and mold is triggering the asthma. But my impression in two-year-olds is that it was used, it's mostly colds that are triggering it. Yeah. 13-year-old, severe nasal and lung symptoms when exposed to cats. Loves animals, wants to be a veterinarian. Oh, I'd love think? to. Yeah, I'd mm-hmm. love to put them on shots if they're willing to. I think this would be a patient that would really um, benefit, honestly, from shots. You could become a veterinarian then. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, not so so much. 
Uh, and then finally, a 16 year old with perennial nasal allergies and asthma worse from early spring through late fall. Yeah, I think this would be um, also a good candidate potentially if they're willing to do it. Yeah, I, I, he's the classical case, isn't he? OK, so you give allergy shots to people who have conditions that improve with allergy shots. If, if you, somebody has something that allergy shots don't help, don't give them allergy shots. That would include nasal dysfunction syndrome. I'm, I'm not calling it rhinitis anymore. I'm trying to start a trend where we call it nasal dysfunction syndrome, um, which could be allergic rhinitis or hay fever. Uh, Allergen-induced asthma, uh, eczema, hymenoptera. Hymenoptera and fire ant hypersensitivity is a totally different thing because patients don't have symptoms because of it. They're just at risk of anaphylaxis. So we're trying to reduce the risk of anaphylaxis. We're not trying to make them feel better. So it's really kind of a different type of allergy shots. Um, what about food allergy? Have you ever thought of giving shots to a patient who has oral allergy syndrome and they're allergic to the tree pollens that cross react with their allergens. Have you ever heard of that? I have. Um, I think with one of the attendings, we did talk about that. I I also, when we were talking about that, that it's the data is kind of all over the place. So it's not like a guarantee that it'll work. So I, I don't, I honestly didn't put that person on AIT. So I'm not sure what to say. I don't know that it'll really make a difference for them, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I, I just don't know. I think if they're desperate and really want to try it, I suppose I'd go along with it. But for the most part, I'd try to discourage them because I just don't know if this would help. What about mosquitoes? I, I'm I'm seeing lots of patients now who come in with huge bites to mosquitoes. And if, if you do an IgE, it's positive. Can you give allergy shots to patients with mosquito allergy? I, w I wish we could because, um, yeah, I agree. I think we get that console frequently especially at like Truman um I think I think I remember last year like one of the um former second years talking about that did I think they mentioned that you mentioned that there was like studies done in like Sweden or Norway that looked at trying to do it and then unfortunately it just didn't find any efficacy so we I don't think we do do it I've never seen it done anyway yeah I mean it's kind of us with but it's so common. Parents come in and their kids are allergic to mosquitoes. IgE is elevated. So you can actually do an immunocap. There is no skin test for mosquito. Uh, mosquito bites uh, do not cause anaphylaxis. There's never been a report of that. The studies were done in the military uh, who serve in northern Canada because uh, northern Canada has lots and lots of monster mosquitoes, giant mosquitoes. And these soldiers will get bitten by 100 mosquitoes a day. They're just terrible. Uh, and um, some of them will actually have a toxic reaction from the saliva, but no anaphylaxis. The question is, can you make their lives better by reducing the size of the reactions they have with allergy shots? And that was actually attempted and it did work, um, but there's no extract from mosquito bites because mosquitoes carry vectors, the diseases and stuff. And so there's no company that wants to make such an extract and guarantee that they won't transmit diseases. So I don't think we're going to ever see mosquito shots in our lifetime unless it's recombinant, I suppose. And and again, we don't know if autoimmune disorders is a problem or not, but probably not. So those are people who might benefit from allergy shots, but who actually needs allergy shots? Uh, I think that you know conditions that improve with allergy shots include, as we said, nasal dysfunction, asthma, maybe eczema, um, but the elephant evidence that the but it's also helpful to have evidence that the relevant allergen actually triggers the condition so if the patient should have allergies if you're going to give them allergy shots a positive skin test elevated ige anybody um have you ever used a blood test to prescribe allergy shots as opposed to a skin test i have and yeah, what do you think about that i mean on i think truthfully as long as you have a good history and kind of understand like the seasonality um if they're you know reactive around cats dogs and what what they seem to be having i think they can be honestly equivalent truthfully between skin testing and blood testing personally mm -hmm. yeah i mean they're they're so highly correlated that the positive blood is probably going to match the positive skin there may be a little bit of variation but there's no reason to think that just how you detect, detect the specific IgE would determine whether the shots would help or not. Um, 
I, I think that if the symptoms are not adequately controlled with avoidance, so if you can just get rid of a pat or just get rid of some exposure that's triggering your symptoms and then you're fine, that certainly is a better approach as long as it's an avoidable thing. If, it, if avoidance is not practical, how do you avoid pollen? It's just out there. Uh, pets become part of your family. It's really hard to avoid pets. So in, in that case, then it may not be possible to uh, use avoidance alone for treatment. Uh, I usually think that if somebody's on medications and somehow they're not adequate, they either don't control the symptoms or they have a lot of side effects, or if the patient just doesn't want to be bothered to take medicine all the time, uh, then, then that's another person who might actually need allergy shots. And then finally, the desire to, patients desire to get allergy spots and they need to do it despite the hassle and expense of allergy shots. Uh, and, and I see this as a problem all the time. Patients who don't really want shots, they're not going to keep getting them. And I see patients who are kind of railroaded into shots because it's very popular. Some private practices kind of push their patients to get shots. Oh, you have to have shots. They, they really push them. Patients feel guilty not going along with what the doctor says, so they, they agree to get the shots. They don't keep coming because they didn't really want the shots. So you have to explain to them what the hassle and expense is and Make sure they really understand it and that if they don't really want the shots, don't, don't offer it because they're not going to be compliant. These are patients who should not get allergy shots. And so patients who have a medical condition where they might not survive anaphylaxis. Um, very young children. This is kind of arbitrary. I think it's cruel and inhuman to give a two-year-old shots. They're already fearful of needles and you know, we're scaring them to death. Uh, pregnancy, does that, have you ever seen that, Dr. Parashar, a pregnant person on shots? Have you had to deal with that? Um, so we um, did have one, um, but they were already on maintenance. So there, I just have seen one and then oh. uh, became pregnant. Yep. Why, why wouldn't you give a pregnant person allergy shots? So I know, uh, I mean, I think you're just at increased um potentially increased reactions. And then obviously the anaphylaxis may be like detrimental to two lives on top of that too. So it's just like the risks outweigh the benefit at that point. And you certainly don't start shots um, while pregnant or increase meat or sorry, increase the um, buildup. But I think if they're already on shots, then you can kind of, it's uh, you can keep them there or they can elect to go off if they're pregnant. Exactly. I mean, the anaphylaxis is not good for pregnancy. Try to avoid it. And it's an inevitable consequence of getting allergy shots. Patients are more likely to have anaphylaxis during the buildup phase than if they're just steady on a maintenance phase. If they're on a maintenance phase, they're likely to be taking less medicine because the shots are helping them control their allergies. And less medicines is probably safer for a pregnant person than uh, avoiding allergy shots. It's just it's a theoretical consideration. I don't think there's any controlled studies of shots in pregnancy. We actually have this indication for allergen immunotherapy form in Cerner. It's it's not designed for you to read it, but it is there and it should be filled out. Whenever you're putting a patient on allergy shots, just put a little X next to the reasons why you're doing it. Allergy shots were picked up, were, were picked apart by the uh, inspector general about 15 years ago. They audited allergy practices and noted that many of the practices didn't indicate why the patient was put on shots. And since there was recent practice parameters that had indications for shots, they said that the allergist needed to document that or else they were violating the, the rules, some kind of rule that could be punished for it. And so in order to defend allergists, they uh, came the joint counsel, which is what it was called back then, came up with this list, which is a pretty nice, easy to fill out list that just shows why the patient would be a candidate for allergy shots. And it's a good idea to put this in the electronic chart. It's available as one of the forms. Nomenclature, allergy shot. What is an allergy shot? Um, basically any injection that's used to treat symptoms of allergies is an allergy shot. It's a pretty generic term. Uh, but it could include a yearly injection of Depomedrol or Kenalog. I mean, that's a lot of patients go in for their annual allergy shot, which is just a shot of steroids. And it, it does work for a short time, but it's not the kind of allergy shots we're talking about here. 
And so I prefer the term allergy immunotherapy to describe what allergists do. We're not giving Depomedrol or Kenalog or something. Uh, so allergy immunotherapy is any treatment that's used to modify the allergic response to an allergen exposure. Uh, at, this could include oral subcutaneous injections of allergens, and there's all kinds of different ways it could be done, but if it modifies the allergic response, then it's allergy immunotherapy. And the types of allergy immunotherapy that we use are subcutaneous injections of an allergy extract. That's called SCIT, subcutaneous immunotherapy. It's also SLIT, which is sublingual allergen immunotherapy, or SLIT. Uh, there's oral, oral immunotherapy, which is an oral ingestion of an allergen. And I guess I should also put epicutaneous immunotherapy, which would be like a patch that modifies immune response. It's been studied for food allergy, for example. So, uh, so per, or, uh, epicutaneous uh, immunotherapy should probably be added to this list. Um, patients need to get uh, give consent before they give allergy immunotherapy. You need to tell the patient why you're doing it and make sure that they are okay with it. Uh, I always tell them what the treatment is and what the alternatives are. The best alternative is don't get allergy immunotherapy, just take your medicines. Um, what are the benefits and risks? Why would you want to get shots and what are the risks of doing so? How much does it cost? I have no idea. I can't really answer this question. The, the consent form says check with your health plan and find out because we don't know what the costs are. Uh, the anticipated duration of therapy is usually three to five years, but sometimes it can be longer. Uh, and any specific policies that affect the treatment. So, for example, we like our patients to carry epinephrine with them. Other offices don't. So, you know, that, that, that's a, something that the patient should know about. The, the real question, though, is does it work? Is there, does allergy shots work? Is there any, any reason to give shots? Uh, and we do know this is one of there are a few studies in this presentation, but this is a Cochrane review, and I can't I love Cochrane reviews because everybody believes the results. Fifty one clinical trials, two thousand eight hundred and seventy one patients, uh, statistically significant reduction in symptom score, and uh, medications data score showed a reduction also. So allergy and immunotherapy was effective for both uh, symptoms and medication use. This is for seasonal allergic rhinitis. So for patients with hay fever, allergy shots work. They make your symptoms get better and they reduce your need for medications. Good stuff. In fact, if you look at, and also asthma, we know that uh, allergy-induced asthma, uh, allergy shots are also effective for that. Now uh, this, uh, this uh, review, this was a systematic review, uh, looked at mostly dust mite because that's what has been mostly studied for asthma. Uh, other allergens have been looked at, and so far most of the allergens do seem to work, um, but most allergens have not been specifically tested for asthma. We're sort of extrapolating from the hay fever data to suggest that if you have an allergen-induced disease, getting rid of that allergen is likely to improve the disease. And we know that if you get allergy shots, um, it can actually reduce the risk of developing asthma in a patient with hay fever. So here are patients who had nasal allergies, but they did not have asthma. And uh, the question is, how many of them went on to develop asthma? And as you can see, in patients who got specific immunotherapy, uh, their risk of asthma didn't seem to go up, whereas you know, the patients who did not, the placebo group, they over time were uh, likely to develop asthma. So there's pretty pretty good evidence, and this has been repeated many times, uh, that allergy shots given before asthma exists in somebody with nasal allergies uh, can reduce the risk of progressing on to developing uh, allergic asthma. We use allergy extracts. That's what we treat our patients with, and I think um, we had uh, Dr. Plunkett talked about what extracts are and how they're made. Uh, these are uh, materials that are expressed in different units. The most common units are weight per volume, which could be one to 100. It's basically one gram of pollen and 100 cc's of buffer. Then you extract it and filter out the undissolved stuff, and that's your weight per volume extract. Protein nitrogen units, uh, they actually measure how much protein is in the extract. Problem is that not all the proteins are allergens and not all the allergens are proteins, so it doesn't necessarily relate to biologic activity. 
Uh, allergy units was the first effort to come up with a biologic activity standardization of extracts. Basically, thousands of little vials of dust mite allergen were put in a freezer at the FDA, and they were labeled 100,000 AU allergy units. And so when you pulled it out, a drug company that was manufacturing dust mite extract would compare the new extract to the reference extract from the FDA. And uh, after comparing it, they could then label their extract in terms of allergy units. The reason 100,000 allergy units was chosen was because if you make five full dilutions, you're down to one allergy unit, and they didn't want to deal with fractions. So they used a big enough number so that dilutions wouldn't result in 0.1 allergy units. Bioequivalent allergy units are basically determined by uh, doing serial dilution uh, uh, measurements of uh, the erythema. Uh, and what you do is you take the extract and you use different dilutions of the extract until you got a 50 millimeter erythema around the extract. And once you got that, then that was defined as a certain number of bioequivalent allergy units. So that's a biologic test, but you have to round up you know, the dozens of patients each time you need to make an extract and you have to do skin tests on their back to calibrate the potency. It's not a very convenient thing. I think more recently they allow uh, immunoassay-based equivalents to be determined. And then finally, you can measure the amount of major allergen. 10 micrograms of AMBE-1 would be a ragweed concentration. Now, the vials usually come labeled as maintenance concentrate one-to-one, -one, which is volume per volume. And then dilutant, dilutions from the maintenance concentrate would be volume to volume, one to 10, one to 100, one to 1,000. So the patient is injected with the maintenance concentrate, and then all dilutions from that are in volume per volume. Number of different extracts are used for shots. Uh, most of them are aqueous. Uh, a lot of them are in 50% glycerin, which is a stabilizing agent. It's what gives it this greasy feel when you touch the uh, skin test extracts. Uh, most Skin, prick skin test extracts come in 50% glycerin. It stabilizes the extract. Uh, glycerin is very irritating, so when you inject it, it causes pain at the local injection site. So you try not to have too much glycerin in the extract that's injected into the patients, but for skin testing, it's okay. Human serum albumin can also help to stabilize the extract. Uh, there were attempts to make extracts that were uh, allergenic, but they're, they're immunogenic, but less allergenic, so that the risk of having an allergic reaction to the shot was decreased, but it would still give you an immune response. Um, different extracts that do that are allergoids. Allergoids are basically allergen extracts that are denatured with formaldehyde. The denatured extracts don't bind to IgE, and therefore you don't have allergic reactions when you give the shots, but they still can be processed by the T cells and are immunogenic. Uh, polymerized extracts is another attempt to do that, where you basically take the extract and you map uh, uh, polymerize it into a giant ball. So only a small number of uh, allergen binding sites are present on the outside, but inside there's a whole bunch of peptides that can stimulate an immune response. And then there's other things, T-cell peptides and immunotory stimulatory sequences, which are adjuvants that can improve the immune response to allergy shots. In the United States right now, we mostly use aqueous extracts, uh, but uh, there are a few uh, alum precipitated extracts that are basically depot preparations, but we don't have allergoids or polymerized or T cell peptides right now. They're being developed. Um, there's different ways of giving allergy extracts. Uh, some allergists will do what's called off the table. Uh, they will take a single syringe and then they'll have a whole, all of the different concentrated extracts laid out on the table. Patient comes in, they take the syringe, they go into the first extract, they draw out a little bit, go into the next one, draw out a little bit, next one, draw out a little bit, and they basically manufacture the patient's extract in real time off of the off the table. Um, single injection is given into the patient. Number of obvious flaws in this uh, approach. One, for one, you can cross-contaminate different extracts. Every time you have to do that, you could make errors in how much you draw up. And by the time the patient gets the injection, the needle is dull because it's gone through all these different stoppers. So the off the table is not recommended. Uh, you can also have shared single vials. Uh, basically, 
there could be multiple injections given from different files. So if, if, if a lot of the patients in your practice get mixed trees, you can have one mixed tree vial and then everybody gets extra shots out of that vial. So the vial could be shared. And then if they need mixed weeds, you go and you take out the mixed weeds and give that to them also. So different injections but from different vials, but the vials are shared among all the different patients in the practice. And then there are shared mixtures where you make common mixtures um, but of different extracts, but some patients who have the same need can share the mixtures. And then patient-specific vials, an extract is prepared for each patient based on what they're allergic to. Turns out that that's what's recommended. Uh, there is some disagreement, probably not as much as there used to be, because a lot of allergists have sort of decided to go along with the standard, which is the patient-specific vials. But in the past, there were a lot of practices that did these other approaches. As a general rule of thumb, you want to prepare vials for each patient, individualized for the patient with identifiers. This reduces the likelihood of error. You make the vial one time and then you're done. It reduces the likelihood of cross-contamination also. What you want to make sure is that there's an effective dose of each component in the vial. You don't want to mix in compatible extracts. Some extracts will uh, interact with other extracts and cause them to be less effective. And then you don't want to include cross-reacting allergens. So if I have a one grass pollen and then another one that's almost identical, no reason to put both of them in. Just put in one that has the representative of that extract. This is, this is an old slide, but I don't think it's really been updated. The manufacturers do have a number of different extracts that they offer, and these are the potencies available by the manufacturers. That, so this is what you can use to make your allergy shots. How much do you need to give to be effective? Um, this is a table from one of the allergy practice parameters on allergy shots. Um, this is not necessarily the best dose. This is the probable effective dose. Um, most allergy shot uh, extracts have not undergone serial dilution dosing studies to see what the actual dose should be. Usually there's one or two doses, maybe three doses studied, and then they decide which one gave the best results. Um, most things don't even have that. So this is just a guess for the most part. Um, we do know that for dust mites, if you inject between 500 and 2,000 allergy units, you're likely to get a beneficial effect. Uh, for cat, 5,000 to 10,000 BAU per mil. Of standardized grass, 1,000 to 4,000 BAU. See, there's a wide range. Uh, ragweed, 6 to 12 micrograms of AMBE-1. General rule of thumb, 10 micrograms of a major allergen is probably going to be an effective dose for whatever that allergen is if something has been measured. Um, and then if most extracts come as 1 to 10, we don't even know what's in them. Uh, we just know how they were made. And in that case, um, 2.5 to 10 milligrams of the highest or the highest tolerated dose, but we don't really know what an effective dose is for these extracts. I used to spend a large amount of time going through the math of how to determine how much to add to a vial, but I decided that was kind of redundant and took up a lot of time and I I was bored, tired of doing it. So this is how much you need to add to a five milliliter vial to get an effective dose of whatever it is that you're injecting. So if you have an unstandardized extract, it comes labeled one to 10 or maybe one to 20. If you put 0.2 to 0.5 milliliters of that into a five milliliter vial, you're going to get an effective dose. Uh, for Timothy, which comes as 100,000 BAU per mil, if you put either 0.1 or 0.2 milliliters into the vial, you will get an effective dose. Same thing with Bermuda grass, dust mite, you need to add 0.25 uh, or 0.5 milliliters to the extract. If you're gonna give Durfarini and Durfarinicinus, they cross react so much, you can add 0.25 of each for the mix. Um, cat takes a lot more, 10,000 allergy units per mil. Um, 1.5 to 3 milliliters should be added to the vial. Dog, if it's AP dog, uh, one to two milliliters needs to be added. If it's just regular dog, it's probably going to require the same amount, but we just don't know. Uh, AP dog, by the way, is acid, acetone precipitate. It's enhanced for CAN-F1. That's why we measure uh, pet components now. 
because a lot of patients aren't allergic to CAN-F1, they're allergic to CAN-F2 or CAN-F4 or some other component. And then there's no reason to give AP-DOG, just give regular dog because it's got CAN-F1 plus the other allergens too. So you probably don't want AP-DOG. So it depends on what the patient's allergic to. When making your vials, it's important to label them correctly. Um, we use a color coding scheme, green, blue, yellow, and red. Uh, green means go, red means stop, yellow is caution, and then we needed a fourth color, so we put blue because blue is a nice color. Um, and silver if you need to make a fifth vial if somebody's really sensitive and they need a fifth dilution. Um, it used to be that the color coding was all over the place, and so you'd open the refrigerator uh, in a private practice where different allergists send their extract, and you'd see a rainbow of all these different colors that meant nothing. So to standardize it, um, use this this system, and then all of the uh, different allergists who produce extracts, the red vial is the top vial, the maintenance concentrate. And then you make tenfold dilutions. So the dilutions would be one to 10, one to 100, one to 1,000. And then if you're gonna put a number on the vial, the top vial is vial number one, and then the second one is two, three, four. You don't wanna name it the other way. If the one, if the thousandfold dilution is vial number one, um, and then two, three, and four, if you have five dilutions, then suddenly your numbers don't match. So to, the only way to get the numbers to be consistent is for the highest concentration vial to be number one. Extracts expire. We have no idea how long they're good for. They're probably good for much longer than this. But if you uh, want to know what an expiration date is, as a good rule of thumb, the maintenance dose is good for six to 12 months. Um, so I use, your patient will be on it for about 12 months anyway, and that's a good amount of time to make it before they have to get a new vial. Um, for the one for the dilutions, one to 10 and one to 100, uh, a six month expiration is reasonable. Usually within six months, they can get through that vial so you don't have to make another vial. Uh, the one to 1000 vial is more dilute, so it expires more quickly. And the one to 10,000 is anybody's guess. I have no idea what what the recommendation is for that. We give allergy shots on a weekly basis. Um, so the patients come in once a week and they get an injection. And there's different phases of giving allergy shots. Uh, the built-up phase involves giving injections with increasing amount of allergens about one or two times per week. And how long it takes to get built up to a maintenance dose depends on how often the shots are given, usually three to six months. I tell the patients, probably wait about six months until they're on a maintenance dose. If they get there earlier, that's great. Once they get to a maintenance dose, then that's the effective dose. Uh, the maintenance dose depends on the level of sensitivity and the response to the buildup. If the patient keeps having reactions to 0.25 cc's and you can never get them higher than that, you can just declare 0.25 or 0.2 as their maintenance dose. You don't have to get to 0.5 cc's of every, for every patient. Not everybody can tolerate 0.5 cc's. Uh, there may be longer, uh, during the maintenance phase, there will be longer periods of time between treatments. Uh, you can go every two weeks. You can spread it out to every four weeks. The reward for coming in regularly and getting built up to a maintenance dose is that you get to come in less frequently. Um, usually don't like to go more than every four weeks, though every six weeks is possible. Uh, there Usually there may be a decrease in symptoms during the buildup phase, but it may take as long as 12 months on the maintenance dose before the patients actually get better. So I tell my patients not to expect their symptoms to improve when they first start the allergy shots. They think, well, now that I'm on shots, I'll start feeling better and that, that's not gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna take at least five to six months before you start to feel better. This is not a fast treatment. And if the shots are successful, we usually continue them for about three to five years. This is what the schedule looks like. Is a buildup phase where you start with the, yellow, the 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 green vial, you give the injections, then you give the yellow, uh, the blue, then the yellow, and you finish with the red vial. Uh, after about four months or five months, however long it takes to get to a maintenance dose, then you spread it out to every two weeks, and then after six months, you spread it out to every four weeks for the remaining duration of the allergy shots. Pretty pretty straightforward. It is possible to build a patient up faster. Um, we, once a week isn't necessarily required. You can come in twice a week. 
Um, I don't recommend more than twice a week. That's a lot. But if somebody lives on a college campus and they can stop in between classes or whatever, sometimes that's a very effective way to, to do it. It's also possible to give more than one injection per visit. So this is what's called a cluster schedule. An allergy shot is considered to be given by cluster if you give more than one allergy shot per visit. So here the patient came in for visit one. They got 0.1 cc of their green vial and they waited a half an hour and then they got 0.4 cc's of their green vial. So they actually got two, two injections in that visit. And if they have enough time, they can wait another half hour. We have them wait a half hour between injections to make sure they're not going to have a reaction. And we can give them 0.1 cc of their blue vial. Um, well, this is great. Look, they've already gone through three of the vial, three injection doses in one visit that speeds it up. It may only take eight visits to get up to a maintenance dose, as opposed to coming in weekly and needing to wait five to six months. This can be a more rapid schedule and some patients uh, will find this to be more convenient. The risk of systemic reaction doesn't seem to be that much more with cluster than it is with weekly injection. So it's a relatively safe thing to do. If you give allergy shots in your practice, you should always ask these questions before you inject a patient. Patients will come in, you get the vial out, they're ready to get their shot, and then you have to ask them certain questions. Always ask these questions. First of all, are you the correct patient for this extract? Make sure you check their name and the date of birth. One of the most common causes of systemic reactions is giving the wrong extract to a patient. Uh, in the last week, have you had increased asthma or allergy symptoms, or have you been using more albuterol? Um, unstable asthma, unstable allergy symptoms increases the risk of a systemic reaction. So if they're having those things, you treat the symptoms and have them come back the next week. In the last week, have you had cold or flu-like symptoms? If the patient's sick, they're more likely to have a systemic reaction. You really don't want to treat a sick patient with allergy shots. Uh, were, did you have any problems after your last allergy shot within 12 hours? Did your arm swell up? Did you have a start wheezing afterwards? You may have started having symptoms after you left the clinic. We wouldn't know about that. It's good to find out. Um, here's another one that I discovered that our clinic doesn't reliably do, and that is asking about medications. Are you on a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor? And have you started taking any new medications which might contain these medicines, including eye drops like atenolol since the last visit? Um, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors don't necessarily make it more likely you'll have a reaction, but they make, make it more difficult to treat a reaction if you should have it. So it's a good idea for the patient not to be on a beta blocker when they're getting allergy shots. If they are on one, you need to at least be aware of it. You need to inform the patient of the increased risk and ideally ask the physician who pre prescribed these drugs if there's an alternative that could reasonably be used instead. Um, and then have you been diagnosed with a new medical condition since your last visit? Some, you know, have you had a heart attack? Or are you gonna die from the allergy shot? You, you wanna know if the patient has had a change in their medical situation since the last visit, things happen. And of course, are you pregnant? Uh, I don't usually ask my young children that, and I don't ask my male patients, but are you pregnant is a question that could be asked, and um, you should find out. When the patient comes in, you want to uh, draw up the extract to the right volume, uh, pinch the skin in the upper arm, and then insert the needle. So this person is doing it properly. You pinch a little skin fold, and then you insert the needle so that it is so it's, uh, intra- it's, sub, it's, it's uh, actually uh, intricate, sub, subcutaneous. Uh, you want to pull back to check for blood. If you've accidentally entered a blood vessel, you might give an injection in intravenously, and that's not a good thing. If there is blood, remove the needle and try again. You don't want to inject intravenously. That would be bad. Uh, if there's no blood, then slowly inject it in subcutaneously. Remove the needle, apply pressure for about 30 seconds so the liquid doesn't come back out and then the patient's good to go. After you've given the injection, patients should wait 30 minutes. Um, there was some controversy, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The allergy community has pretty much settled on 30 minutes. It's an easy amount of time to tell the patients. Most systemic reactions do occur within that time frame. 
it's a good time to do homework after school, good watch TV, play with your iPad, whatever you want to do. Um, and then after 30 minutes, the patient should be checked before they leave. Make sure that the, the site reaction, if there's been any, and document that they're not in the process of having a systemic reaction when they leave, that they're in good health. Remember, it is possible to react more than 30 minutes after an injection. Patients should either call the clinic or go to a nearby emergency department should this happen. And then the question is, should patients be asked to carry epinephrine? And that's really controversial. If you ask 10 allergists, you'll get five will say no, five will say yes. Another five will say, well, if they've already had a reaction, then I'll have them carry epinephrine in case they have another reaction. I don't know. I'd rather, in our clinic, we tend to focus on safety. So we do ask our patients to carry epinephrine. Uh, other clinics don't. It's really a clinic-specific policy thing. Local reactions occur. They're pretty common. Redness and swelling and heat at the injection site. Uh, it's unclear whether they're predictive of future reactions. It used to be that if you had a large local, we'd stop increasing it. We'd go back because you might have a severe reaction. Turns out that it doesn't predict future reactions. It's more a function of the local injection. So you can treat it with ice. You can put hydrocortisone on it. Calamine may help uh, and so on. But if it's persistent, uh, you should consider pre-medicating the patient with an H1 blocker. A lot of patients are on that anyway. Uh, you might have to decrease the dose or the rate of buildup if the patient is too uncomfortable. It's just not worth it. And if you're using a single vial, if you don't have two vials that you're injecting, then you might consider splitting the dose into two smaller injections. Instead of 0.5 in the left arm, you might give 0.25 in each arm. That way, they're less likely to have a local reaction. Um, signs and so allergy shots are associated with systemic reactions. You know what the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis are, urticaria, trouble breathing, feeling of doom. I've actually had a patient say, I feel like doom. I thought, I thought that was a myth until the patient said it. And I said, oh, doom, I, I guess we better do something. They do say it. Uh, severe itching all over the place, GI or uterine cramping, throwing up, hypotension, of course, is a clear sign. Uh, the onset is usually rapid, most of them within 30 minutes, though delayed reactions have been reported. Uh, the incidence of injection reactions is less than 0.05% uh, per injection. One in 12 patients at some point during their uh, allergy shots will have a systemic reaction. So there's a, I tell my patients there's a one in 12 chance that you will have a systemic reaction, maybe 8% chance. It's not very likely but it does happen enough that you should be aware that it is something that can happen. Okay, what factors that increase the risk of a systemic reaction or reduce its effectiveness? So if your asthma is out of control, you're more likely to react. If you're really, really sensitive to the things you're injecting into the patient, they have a very high degree of sensitivity, they're more likely to have systemic reactions when they get to the higher doses, so just be prepared. If a patient is using a beta blocker, it's harder to treat the reaction, though it is possible. The treatment is just giving more epinephrine um, and possibly ACE inhibitors. It's a little bit less clear. The ACE receptor blockers, by the way, don't seem to be a problem. It's just the ACE inhibitors. Um, dosing error. Uh, if you give the wrong injection to the wrong patient or you give the wrong dose, that's actually one of the mo more common causes of a systemic reaction. It can also be very hard to track down. Patients who've had a previous systemic reaction are more likely to have a future systemic reaction. Uh, when you get a new vial, the vial might be a little bit different in potency than the old vial, especially if the old vial is 12 months old, its potency may have waned a little bit. The new vial might be more potent. So we usually, for the first injection, just for caution, uh, we usually decrease the dose of the first injection from a new vial. Uh, an injection given during period of allergy exacerbation. This is ragweed season right now. Patients who are just miserable with their nasal allergies and their asthma is flaring up. Those are patients who are more likely to have a systemic reaction if you give them an allergy shot. I don't, I'm not going to spend much time on this. We already know epinephrine is the treatment for anaphylaxis. Our, our clinic uses auto injectors. We don't have little vials and draw them up and all that. It's, it's considered to be too time. It, it takes too much time to get the vial out, break it open, draw it up, 
inject the patient. There's these little glass shards that could theoretically get into it. So we keep epinephrine auto injectors at the bedside or the table side, whatever it is. And if the patient has a reaction, we use an epinephrine auto injector. You can very quickly get the epinephrine into the patient. Uh, if a patient is having a bad reaction, it's very scary. Um, don't forget, you can place a tourniquet above the injection site. The injection is given in the upper arm. It's never given in the leg or the abdomen or any place else. It's given in the arm for a reason. That's because you can put a tourniquet above the injection site. That slows down allergen absorption uh, and can definitely reduce the severity and speed of onset of a reaction. Um, so I've had patients who were turning bright red and wheezing and having all kinds of allergy shots. Symptoms, obviously, we treat it with epinephrine, but they're really having major allergy symptoms. If you need something fast, take a tourniquet, put it around the upper arm and close it, and the patient will blanch out almost immediately. The symptoms will immediately turn off. I've seen this happen. It's just amazing. And then they're feeling good. If you release the tourniquet again, then the symptoms will start to come back and you can kind of titrate it. Let the allergen get absorbed slowly that by just titrating the, the tourniquet. It can be a very effective treatment, so don't forget about it. Most allergists forget that that's an option. Okay, if a patient has a history of an allergy shot systemic reaction, there are things you can do to mitigate that. Uh, you can have them take an H1 antihistamine before they come in for their injection. Traditionally, Benadryl is given. It's not very effective. Cetirizine seems to work better. It's what I usually recommend. H2 antihistamines, they don't help. They're not recommended. It doesn't do any good to give an H2 antihistamine. Uh, oh, and this is if you uh, want to treat a shot systemic reaction. Excuse me, I didn't read it correctly. Patients having a systemic reaction, you can give a cetirizine. Uh, H2 blockers don't help for anaphylaxis. Don't give H2 blockers. Corticosteroids, they don't recommend that for anaphylaxis either. It doesn't reduce the risk of a late phase reaction. It doesn't make the anaphylaxis any better. Don't give, you don't have to give H2 or corticosteroids. If the patient is really sick, they might need oxygen, bronchodilators, IV fluids, and don't forget the tourniquet. That can really turn off a reaction. Okay, we're almost done. This has been a long talk, but I hope it's been practical. If you have a patient who comes in for different reasons, there may be a need to adjust the dose. So after they get two or three injections from their maintenance dose, uh, we usually spread it to every two weeks. If they're still doing well after six months, we spread it to every four weeks. So the patient can come in less often once they reach a maintenance dose. Occasionally, patients will tolerate every six weeks. They ought to check with the allergist first. When you give a new vial, reduce the dose by 50%. If that's tolerated, then the next time they come in, resume the full dose treatment with the next vial. This is just a standard recommendation that the allergy community follows. If a patient has had a systemic reaction, you want to reduce the next dose by at least 50%. If they tolerate that, rather than resuming the previous dose, slowly advance back to the previous dose and then continue on up if indicated. That way you have a lower risk of repeating the anaphylactic reaction. If it was a severe systemic reaction, the patient really had anaphylaxis, they had to be hospitalized, whatever, I like to see them before they get another injection just to see if they really want the shots because this may be a reason to stop getting allergy shots if, if they're really, if their life is in jeopardy. If a patient is on a weekly injection and they miss injections, what you can do is reduce by one step for each missed week after three weeks. Give them three weeks, you don't have to do anything. If they come in four weeks later, but they've been getting it weekly, then you might cut back by one step and then rebuild them back up. If they're on every two week schedule, reduce by one step for every missed week after six weeks because they're on a less frequent schedule. And if they're on a monthly schedule, you can reduce by one step for each missed week after eight weeks. This is just a rule of thumb. There's no double blind studies proving that this is right, but it comes up all the time and everybody wants to know, what do I do with the dose? And so this just kind of gives you some standard thing that you can provide uh, recommendations for. Okay, total duration of shots. Patients who stop after one year of shots usually feel better, but then they relapse. So allergy shots don't continue. They're not a long-term treatment if you only get it for one year. What's the point? You really haven't accomplished anything. If they complete three years of treatment, 
then they likely are going to receive long-term benefit. They'll stay in remission. There's really no evidence that treatment for more than three years gives additional benefit, but some patients may prefer that anyway, just in case it does provide benefit. They, they just are so desperate to not have their symptoms come back that they want to keep getting it. And this study was done by Steve Durham. It's as far as I know, it's the only study that was ever done showing that you continue to get benefit after three years of stopping shots. If you've after you've had after stopping shots, uh, if you've received them for at least three years. So to summarize, allergen immunotherapy (AIT) can reduce the sensitivity of an allergic patient to their allergen. Some cases can lead to remission. The indications include you have to have IgE. Uh, to a specific allergen, you're likely to continue to be exposed to that allergen. Uh, there have to be, a, ideally, there's evidence that you had symptoms when you were exposed to the allergen. And you want to, uh, you, you, there, there's an informed desire by the patient to get allergen immunotherapy. Once they know what's involved, they still want to do it. So make sure they're informed. Medical conditions that improve include allergic rhinitis, allergy-induced asthma, atopic dermatitis, we didn't really talk about that. Hymenoptera allergy, again, we're not treating symptoms there, we're trying to prevent anaphylaxis, it's a totally separate case. Contraindications include medical conditions that you might not survive anaphylaxis. Uh, use of medications that increase the likelihood of anaphylaxis to reduce its effectiveness, such as beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, is not an absolute contraindication, but at least you need to be aware of this increased risk and make an effort to see if there's an alternative agent that could be used by contacting whoever prescribed these agents. Use patient-specific vials. An effective dose of each allergen should be delivered when at a maintenance dose, and the patient should have their own vial, and they need to be properly labeled so that you don't make mistakes. Allergen immunotherapy needs to be given safely. Ask pre-injection questions, inject properly, observe for 30 minutes, do all the stuff you need to do, and you'll be able to give allergen immunotherapy as safely as we know how to do it. And the, the total duration is usually three to five years. At the end of the third year, usually at the beginning of the third year, I start the discussion. I tell the patient that at the end of three years, we're going to start talking about whether we need to continue this or not, because I can't really say that longer than three years is any better than three years. And with that, I'm going to stop. It's, the hour is almost up, but uh, I hope that you enjoy treating, treating patients with allergy shots, allergen immunotherapy, and then that you stay safe during this pandemic time. So with that, I will stop and ask if anybody has any questions.